Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins, City Club President, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS Radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's CityNet 30. Thank you for joining us at City Club today on Friday, October 8th for today's forum. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, would everyone in the room please make sure your cell phones are silenced? Today we will hear from Oregon gubernatorial candidate John Kitzhaber. But first, some announcements. I'd like to start by recognizing any new City Club members who are here today or anyone who is attending a Friday Forum for the first time in a long time. Would you please stand and let us welcome you? We would also like to take a few minutes to thank the members of City Club's Leadership Circle. These are donors who contribute more than $1,000 to our annual fund campaign each year. The Leadership Circle was started in fall of 2006 under the direction of Club President Susan Hammer and Executive Director Wendy Willis. They both saw the need to increase financial leadership opportunities and recognition within the club. Thanks to their vision, leadership gifts have totaled over $275,000, making up about 60% of our annual giving. The support of these members is vital to continuing City Club's 94-year-old mission of educating and engaging members and the public in critical issues. At this time, I would like to ask all of those who were members of the Leadership Circle last year to please stand and let us recognize you. On your tables, you'll find more information about the Leadership Circle donation levels and benefits. Please consider making a leadership gift this fall and joining this important group of City Club supporters. And finally, as always, we offer our appreciation to our Friday Forum corporate sponsors whose generous financial support make these City Club luncheons possible. Please join me in offering our sincere appreciation to our fall season sponsors, AARP Oregon, the law firm of Baron Liebman, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, and PGE. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's program. Today's moderator is Russ Lewis, who anchors KGW News Channel 8's number one rated Sunrise and Noon broadcasts, along with Brenda Braxton and Nick Allard. He's been a journalist for 22 years. He moved to Portland 12 years ago to join KGW has, and has enjoyed making the Northwest his home with his wife and two young daughters. Russ? Thank you and good afternoon. Pleasure to be back with you today here at City Club. Always enjoy being here. It's my privilege to moderate today's forum with John Kitzhaber, who we are extremely pleased to have with us today. City Club of Portland regret, regrets that Oregon gubernatorial candidate Chris Dudley declined our invitation to participate in today's forum. City Club did extend the invitation, obviously, to both candidates to debate the issues more than a month ago offering the option of multiple dates, but received official word that Chris Dudley chose not to appear here today. The fact that Mr. Kitzhaber accepted City Club's invitation entitled him to appear today. Longstanding City Club policy is to honor an invitation that is accepted, even though a two-person debate would have been more in keeping with the club's mission and voters' best interest. Conducting a debate suggests that two or more candidates will offer opposing positions on various topics. Since we only have one candidate with us today, City Club would like to characterize this program as a question and answer session. Today's session will have several sections to it. First, our candidate will give a five-minute opening statement. Following that, he will respond to questions written in advance of this gathering today by City Club's Friday Forum Committee and City Club staff. 
These are the only questions that will be asked today. There will be no questions from the floor. The candidate will have up to two minutes to respond to each question. The forum will wrap up with a five-minute closing statement from the candidate. We will rely on the judgment of our distinguished panel of City Club members seated at the table here in front of me to decide whether or not the speaker has indeed answered my questions. If two or more of these members raise their cards, there they are, the question mark a card there. If we get two out of three, that means they feel the question has not been answered. So I will restate the question, and Dr. Kitzhaber will have 90 seconds to reply again. On our panel this afternoon, we have Elizabeth Friedenwald, Jean Hart, and Valerie Plummer. Keeping our time today will be Elaine McCall. I ask that you please be respectful of the candidate and hold your applause during the session. And now, today's guest. John Kitzhaber practiced as an emergency room doctor in Roseburg from 1974 through 1988, during which time he also began his political career. He was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives from Douglas County in 1978, then elected to the Oregon Senate for three terms beginning in 1980. There he served as Senate President for a number of sessions and is best known for his role in creating the Oregon Health Plan. John Kitzhaber was elected Governor of the State of Oregon in 1994, re-elected in 1998. Since leaving office in 2002, he has continued to work on health care reform and is the founder of the Archimedes Movement, a nonprofit organization dedicated to civic involvement in improving health care policy. As I step down here to the moderator's table, let's welcome John Kitzhaber with a round of applause. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, be here today. As I was preparing for this opportunity to make a few opening comments today, I got to thinking about all of the policy issues I could uh, cram into five minutes. Uh, probably won't surprise you. Uh, but decided to uh, take a little bit different tack. And what I'd like to do in my five minutes is uh, share with you uh, one of the most formative experiences of my life. Perhaps the single most defining moment in the career of an emergency room physician is the first time you make a decision to open someone's chest. Now, for me, that involved a young man in his early 20s who arrived in full cardiac arrest with a small caliber gunshot wound in his upper abdomen that had gone up and to the left and exited through his back. The paramedics were performing CPR, but by the time we got him into the ER, it became very apparent that the external cardiac massage was not generating a pulse. So I came to the conclusion that the bullet must have torn his heart. In other words, the external compression on the chest was moving blood out of the hole in his heart and not around through his body to his brain and his other vital organs. So I made the decision to crack the chest. What does that entail? It involves taking a scalpel and making a deep incision between the ribs on the left side and putting in a rib spreader and pushing the ribs further apart so you can move the lung inside and reach in and repair the tear to the heart. Now, the decision to open a chest in the emergency room requires integrating a lot of information in a very short period of time. It involves deciding and acting, and you need to be right. I can still remember holding the scalpel before making the incision, clearly recognizing that I was committing myself and this young man to a course of action for which I would be accountable. We weren't going to get a second opportunity. I tell you that story because I think Oregon is faced with a similar moment of truth. We have some decisions to make, really big decisions, and we don't have a lot of time to make them. We have a growing disparity, a huge and growing disparity between public resources and the cost of our public programs, and quite frankly, between what we want and our willingness and ability to pay for it. We're facing a budget deficit of over $3 billion, and I don't think we have fully come to terms with what that means for us. From Election Day on November 2nd until the end of the biennium on June 3rd, we have less than eight months to balance our budget. How we choose to do that 
how we choose to invest the resources we know we have, how we set our priorities, and the degree of civility with which we do that is going to set the course of our state for a decade. And we need to be right, because we're not going to have a second chance here. Those are the stakes for our state, and those are the stakes in this governor's race. We don't have much time to integrate a lot of information to decide and to act, and we have to be right. How we move forward from here and how we do that together is what we need to be talking about in detail and in very, very specific terms. I'm here because I'm eager and ready to do that. So let's get started. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kitzhaber. I'll remind everybody to please hold your applause as we move through the questions. We'll start with question number one. I know you've been reminded hundreds of times, maybe more, that you uh, said once leaving office eight years ago that Oregon was ungovernable. Some might claim this is due to provisions in the Constitution itself, our initiative system, or maybe just the political culture in general. Do you think there's anything uniquely dysfunctional about politics in Oregon that needs to change and what would you do to change it? Uh, the answer is no. I don't think there is anything uniquely dysfunctional, but I do think we have a problem not just in Oregon, uh, but around the nation, and that is a system that has become increasingly focused on the acquisition and retention of partisan majorities rather than the use of those majorities to act actually act in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the public interest. And I think that is... Um, uh, exacerbated by a politics that is characterized by narrow stakeholder interests. Whether you're an advocate for health care or education or public safety, we tend to view the body politic, we tend to view the legislative process and certainly our budget in pieces, in silos. To draw an ER analogy, that would be like seeing someone as a kidney or a heart or a knee rather than a human being. And I think the opportunity facing Oregon and indeed the opportunity embedded in this deep budget crisis is to adopt a more holistic view of our state and of each other and try to take the resources that we have instead of arguing about how to cut, ask ourselves how to invest those resources going forward based on what we want our state to look like 10 years from now. To use the next eight months to build the foundation for reinvesting in the state of Oregon. It's going to be a very, very heavy lift and we can't do it unless we all lift together. And I think the responsibility of the governor is to encourage people, to inspire people, to provide people the opportunity to see Oregon as a whole and to recognize that the choices we make in the next eight months are choices not just for us, but for the children and grandchildren who will come after us. Question number two is this. Oregon's budget is facing an estimated $3 billion deficit over the next two years. What percentage of this shortfall do you believe should be made up with spending cuts and what percentage with new revenues? And please explain your rationale for the ideal mix, and you have two minutes to do that. <laughs> Good luck. 63 and 42. Um, I, I think that the governor is required, whoever the governor is, is required to constitutionally to provide a budget that's balanced with the resources that we have. And I intend to do that, and I intend to put that budget together, not based on the old current service level approach, which is what did we spend last year, and how has that cost increased by enrollment growth or population growth or inflation, uh, and use that as a starting point, but rather saying here's the amount of money we know we have. How should we spend that to create a platform for reinvesting in Oregon's educational system, reinvesting in our important social services, and to help reinvest and stimulate our private sector economy? Along with that budget, I think we need to provide a reinvestment budget that essentially shows where we'll spend the next dollar that becomes available, whether it comes from the private uh, uh, growth in the private sector economy or cost savings. Now, at that point, we may make a decision that we want to make a down payment on that reinvestment budget in the 2011-13, which would get us into a revenue discussion. My litmus test, however, is the revenue discussion has to be not just about balancing the budget in 2011, it has to be a step to essentially moving the state in the direction we want to go for the next 10 years. 
So it's, it's going to have to be a broader discussion. So I expect that I will be flagged by the Truth Squad here, but I don't think I can give you a percentage uh, of how much we need to spend uh, 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 cover by cuts and how much we need to uh, cover by new revenue until we've actually had a discussion in Oregon about the priorities that we want this state to reflect in the choices we make in 2011. Question number three, and they didn't flag you, so. Uh, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were twitching over there, I could see it. <laughs> the governor's reset cabinet recently observed that there is a disconnect between Oregonians' perception that crime is on the rise and the reality that Oregon is safer today than it has been in decades. This perception may help explain the continued popularity of costly voter-approved tough-on-crime measures. What would you do to address public safety concerns while still limiting a projected skyrocket in the corrections budget? Well, you know, as uh, Huxley once said, facts do not cease to exist just because you choose to ignore them. And the fact is that uh, crime rates are going down in Oregon and in many places in the country. I think we have a commitment uh, in the way we balance our budget uh, to ensure that uh, violent, dangerous criminals remain behind bars and out of our communities. But I also think we need to recognize that we have 14,000 prison beds in the state and we need to manage those in a way that doesn't compel us to build another prison because essentially those resources are coming out of the front end. They're coming out of education, they're coming out of investments in kids and families, the kind of investments that keeps people in school, in the workforce, and out of prison in, 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 the, in, in, the, in the long time, long term. So I think the governor has to be a spokesperson to talk about what's really going on, to ensure people that we have a responsibility and in fact a commitment to ensure the public safety, but that there are other ways to operate the criminal justice system besides simple incarceration. Many states have done this. New York has actually reduced its prison population and has very good uh, and improving public uh, uh, safety statistics. So that's a conversation we have to have with, with, uh, with Oregonians, and I believe we need to uh, also recognize that when we invest resources in prisons, those resources come from something else. Uh, I was elected with Measure 11 in 1994, and we ended up citing a large number of prisons in Oregon, and those resources came right out of juvenile crime pre prevention investments and the kinds of uh, uh, investments that are absolutely essential for kids to, uh, to, uh, uh, to lead uh, healthy, productive uh, lives and find a place in the economy. So um, I think uh, we need to engage in that conversation, shouldn't run away from it, uh, and we'll have an opportunity, I think, during this campaign because of the ballot measure that would actually increase uh, 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 sentencing. We need two votes, only got one there, so we'll move on. Question number four. According to the Oregonian, sales of Oregon goods overseas in 2009 dropped 23 percent from the year before, costing the state of Oregon billions of dollars and contributing to Oregon's high unemployment. Given the financial importance of international trade to the Oregon economy, how would you promote Oregon products and services for export? Well, we need to recognize, obviously, that our traded sector industries are the cornerstone of our long-term economic viability. These are the companies, the goods, and, and increasingly the services that uh, are sold uh, on the, in the international market and actually bring new capital into the state of Oregon. Uh, I think, uh, clearly, the state has a, a significant role in promoting uh, international trade through direct trade missions to, to uh, creating connections between Oregon products, Oregon businesses, and, and Oregon markets. When I was governor, for example, we introduced Oregon grass seed to the Chinese market. That was through direct uh, relationships and, and, uh, and connections between the state uh, and, uh, and China. I think that needs to continue to be a significant uh, uh, element of our, of our economic development strategy. I think we also have an obligation to ensure uh, an infrastructure for international trade, which involves a transportation system that allows uh, 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 efficient freight movement from the state of Oregon to the Port of Portland, which is the, 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 the portal or gateway to the international economy. Uh, and I also think that it's important to recognize that while traded sector industries are very, very significant for the state of Oregon, uh, we can do a much better job keeping the capital that comes in circulating here through uh, local supply chains, through local sourcing, through a, using our data connectory base to connect, let's say, the wood products industry with our green building industry here in the state of Oregon. Um, 
I think our future uh, will continue to center on our ability to compete internationally. Uh, and long term, that's also going to involve uh, a, a reinvestment in our system of public education to ensure that we have a workforce that is ready uh, uh, to compete uh, in a global economy. As decided during union negotiations, the Oregon Public Employees Retirement System, also known as PERS, currently directs that employers, which is to say the government, cover a 6% contribution that employees would otherwise be required to pay into the system. Making a change from an employer to an employee retirement contribution could reduce state spending by approximately $750 million over the next two years. Would you support such a change? Why or why not? I do support revisiting the 6% pickup as a central element of negotiations between the state and uh, public employees. I've been very clear on that uh, since I entered this race last September. The PERS system is an employment-based system and it lost about 27% of its value in 2008 along with everybody else. Uh, and um, because of that, because of the requirement for the employer to make that contribution, a, a, a significant piece of the budget deficit, although certainly not the majority, uh, is, uh, is related to the PERS system. And we do have to uh, put that on the table along with a total compensation package, along with uh, uh, COLAs and step increases and, uh, in the case of state workers, uh, uh, contributions to uh, uh, state health care. Uh, and we do need to reduce the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the rate of increase of overall compensation for uh, public employees. Question number six, Oregon's business energy tax credit, which rewards companies investing in renewable energy, has helped lift Oregon to the forefront of the green energy sector. But over the next four years, Oregon may find itself paying out nearly $450 million more in tax credits than originally estimated. Renewable energy supporters are worried that new limits designed to rein in costs will discourage green companies and jobs from coming to Oregon. How would you ensure that Oregon remains an attractive choice for green businesses without breaking the state budget? Well, I think there were two problems with the Betsy. One is that it was trying to be all things to all people. If you're trying to incent uh, manufacturing jobs like Solar World in, in Oregon, that's one set of incentives. If you're trying to incent uh, wind generation, that's another set of incentives. If you're trying to incent uh, community scale uh, uh, generation or conservation, that's another set of incentives. So uh, the, that's, that's the first problem. The second problem is I don't think we have a clear strategy to achieve our RPS and our long-term carbon reduction goals. So one of my um, uh, uh, proposals is within the first 100 days of the administration is to try to develop a, a thoughtful 10-year strategy to achieve our, our, uh, our, 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 our RPS, our movement to a lower carbon economy. And within that, we need to use the, the tax credit program to whatever extent we are able to and willing to fund it next session to move us in that direction. So instead of simply incentives for a wind farm in southeast Oregon or an incentive to bring in a solar manufacturing company, it need, those investments need to be very intentional in terms of moving us towards uh, the ability to achieve uh, our, uh, our energy future objectives. And that does include things like transmission siting. If we want, in fact, to have a wind generation in south uh, east Oregon, uh, we're going to have to bring that power to where the load is, which is over here, and you can't, it can't take 10 years to site a transmission line. So I think that's the opportunity to create a, a transparent strategy for moving forward that allows us to make accountable choices uh, and not to view the energy future in, 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 in small increments, which I think is, uh, was one of the problems with, uh, with the Betsy as it was structured. This next question is a two-parter. Back in 1999, you received a home loan from the stock brokerage firm Bidwell & Company that was not available to the average home buyer. You later nominated Jerry Bidwell, the company's owner, to the Oregon Investment Council. So the two questions are these. Why didn't you just get a standard home loan, and why didn't you disclose when you nominated him to the council that you had personal business dealings with your nominee? Uh, in 1999, I uh, took out a loan from Bidwell & Company, which I had been doing business with for 10 years uh, and had significant uh, investments in the company. Uh, I was able to take out the full loan, which is why I did it. Uh, I secured the loan with a mortgage, with a trust deed. Uh, I paid uh, market, uh, uh, market rate interest plus. Uh, paid the loan off early. Uh, and uh, that's the story on the house. 
uh, on Mr. Bidwell, I appointed someone who I believe was uh, uh, highly qualified for the position on the Oregon Investment Council. I didn't appoint him, actually, I nominated him. Uh, he went through executive confirmation uh, and was examined uh, by the members of the Senate Executive Confirmation Committee, which was controlled by the Republicans, and he was, nom he was uh, confirmed by them. The Oregon Ethics Report requires uh, uh, you to uh, list certain information, but specifically does not require you to uh, list uh, 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 mortgages. Uh, if you look at the forum, you'll see that, uh, and um, that's why I didn't list the mortgage. If it had required us to do that, I certainly would have. Question number eight. At a monthly cost of $1,070 per worker, the full cost of employee health care is arguably not sustainable for the state. What would you do to ensure quality and affordable health care for government employees while still keeping the cost manageable? Well, I would say that this is a question that should be applied to private sector employees as well. The cost of health care is breaking the bank for the state. It's breaking the bank for private sector employers. The small group insurance market is hemorrhaging. And this, we, this is a big problem we've got to address as a nation. I think we need to start by reminding ourselves that the objective is not simply to pay for health care, but to actually keep people healthy. And the national health insurance bill really was a debate about health insurance reform, not health care reform. So it's provided a pathway for insurance coverage for most Oregonians by 2014, but doesn't address the underlying cost drivers of health. To do that, we need to recognize that most of the cost is embedded in a delivery system that's focused on acute care rather than prevention and wellness and the community-based management of chronic conditions like diabetes or congestive heart failure, where about 80% of the cost in the healthcare system resides. Our opportunity in Oregon is to seek some broad federal waivers to give us flexibility in how we use at least some of those new monies to create a big demonstration project in delivery system reform that is, in fact, focused on prevention and wellness uh, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and community based management of chronic conditions. Uh, that is uh, uh, something we have the opportunity to do uh, here in Oregon. I believe that our pilot project would not only benefit Oregon uh, and Oregon employers, but it could be a model uh, for uh, other states uh, going forward. I know the administration is very interested in having several states demonstrate that this isn't just an insurance reform effort, this is a health care reform effort. Let me finally say that. In, 19, in the late 1980s, uh, I was involved with the effort to reform our workers' compensation system, which has saved Oregon employers $14 billion. Can you imagine the kind of competitive advantage we could have in Oregon if we could develop a way to actually reduce the cost of, of uh, or at least the rate of increase in, in medical costs without sacrificing quality? Uh, we have the opportunity to do it, and we need to seize that opportunity. One way to raise money during cash-strapped times is by borrowing, of course, essentially issuing bonds. But State Treasurer Ted Wheeler recently urged that the state not borrow its way out of this budget crisis. Doing so, he argued, can lead to a lower credit rating, making borrowing more expensive and increasing the annual interest payments on that debt. Do you support Treasurer Wheeler's proposed temporary halt to public borrowing? And please explain why or why not. Uh, the answer is yes, I do. Uh, we tried to, in terms of the uh, uh, debt service, the, the percentage of the general fund committed to debt service, we have felt that 5% was a prudent number. I believe the legislature approved about a billion dollars <throat> in new bonds, 400 million of which have been sold, and that has bumped that percentage up uh, to, I think, 5.2%, and if the other 600 million were sold, it would bump it up higher. So I do believe that we need to maintain um, uh, something near that 5% level going forward uh, to protect uh, Oregon's uh, bond rating. And I anticipate we'll have a question about my bonding for large scale energy efficiency, but I'll wait till you ask it. <clears throat> like President Barack Obama and his Education Secretary Arne Duncan, your opponent Chris Dudley supports basing teacher pay on teacher performance. The Oregon Education Association and its national parent organization which have endorsed your candidacy and contributed $225,000 to your campaign no oppose merit pay. That's what it says here. Do you support basing teacher pay on teacher performance? Why or why not? Um, I do believe there's a relationship, and I do think uh, that the, uh, the uh, uh, class project that's being undertaken right now in three or four school districts uh, does give a compensation uh, increase pass for teachers, but it's based on multiple factors, not simply uh, uh, a classroom performance. It's also based on leadership and a few other factors. What I don't support 
uh, is basing a teacher's salaries or teacher's performance on performance on a standardized test. There are a host of issues that are completely beyond the control of the classroom teacher, whether the kids come to school hungry, whether they're living you know, in a car, uh, whether they can't speak English, there's a huge, whether their parents are involved in their education. What we need is a, as, is a, is a growth model where we can actually look at where the students started out and how uh, much progress the student has made. That gives us the ability to bring additional resources to students. And this is a performance, would be a, a, way, a way to measure uh, teacher and student performance. Resources to students who need it, additional professional development to uh, teachers who need it. And I do think that kind of a, a, a growth model could, should be one factor uh, in, uh, in determining uh, t teacher uh, pay. In order to close the budget gap, some have suggested raising or establishing taxes on cigarettes, alcohol, and sugary soft drinks. In fact, a tax on soda pop alone could net $200 million over two years. Your opponent has said he would not raise these so-called sin taxes, though some that are already on the books have not been increased in several decades. So would you support instituting or raising taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, and soda pop? Well, I have, in fact, uh, supported raising taxes on alcohol and tobacco. I think there's a clear relationship between the cost of a pack of cigarettes and the number of kids who actually start smoking in the first place. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a, 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 a soda pop tax I in Oregon. You know, I would be open to that, uh, but it seems to me we're missing the larger uh, issue here. Uh, the, the availability of soda pop uh, isn't actually as much of a problem as uh, the desire of people to drink it. Uh, you know, and if you look at, if you look at, uh, hello, uh, <laughs> if you look at those factors that have the biggest impact on people's health, 40% uh, are lifestyle and behavioral, 40%, and 15% uh, are socioeconomic issues, which have a huge impact on the ability of people to make, you know, good quality lifestyle choices. 30% uh, are genetics, only 10% has anything to do with involvement in the U.S. medical system. So I think the point here that we're trying to get at and we're dancing around, and as I said, if, if, you know, if you were to do that, it would have to be part of a larger strategy, it seems to me. The big drivers of population health have nothing to do with the formal medical system. They're, 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 they're socioeconomic issues in, in the community. Uh, and if we were tr to address those, which ultimately we're going to have to do, uh, trying to discourage people from consumption of uh, tobacco and alcohol and, uh, and uh, not just uh, uh, a soda pop, but, uh, you know, uh, refined sugar and a whole host of other things needs to be a part of that strategy. I just think that it's a, it's a debate that uh, is treating a symptom rather than the problem. All right, that's all the questions I have. Truth Squad, am I missing anything? Anything you want to revisit? Now's your chance. Okay, thank you. This uh, will conclude the questioning. We move to the final portion of the program, a five-minute closing statement from our speaker, Dr. Kitzhaber. You have five minutes. In July of uh, 1973, I watched a baby die. Uh, his name was Sam. He weighed less than three pounds when he was born and didn't really have a chance from the start. He was uh, born to a teenage mother who came into the emergency room in labor. Uh, she was anemic. Uh, she hadn't had uh, any prenatal care during the entire course of her pregnancy. And Sam wasn't breathing when we delivered him in the ER. And we had to resuscitate him before we transferred him to the neonatal intensive care unit. Uh, and I was part of his short life from the moment he was born till the moment he died two days later. And I can still remember standing by the incubator during that final hour and uh, looking into his eyes, knowing what was going to happen, and feeling very depressed and very helpless. And I remember what a quiet death it was. There was no one in the room but me and his mom and a nurse. Nobody else knew about this little baby's two-day two fight to, to survive. Never made the newspapers, never made the evening news. It was an anonymous tragedy that touched the lives only of those people who were directly uh, involved. I remember Sam's death because it was one of the first I'd seen as an intern. It was a quiet, unremarkable death of someone at the very, very beginning of life. Now, Sam died because we didn't know as much then as we do now about treating respiratory distress syndrome in newborns. But he also died because somehow no one had made the token investment 
to give his mother the prenatal care she needed during her pregnancy that could have prevented his prematurity and his low birth weight in the first place. Sam died over 35 years ago. But those anonymous tragedies are still happening here in our state, and they're accelerating. In our general fund, there is a relentless trend towards spending more and more money on public safety and corrections and the human consequences of neglect and abuse and addiction, and less and less money on education, on prevention, on investing in children and families. And one of the central challenges that we have in the next eight months is to turn that around is to try to change our pattern of investments in this next budget, to decide what we want our state to look like 10 years from now, and to use the next budget as a foundation for building that future for the state of Oregon. That's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. We need to decide what's best for Oregon. And we need to act, and we can't be wrong, because we're not going to get another shot at this. Every election is a choice, including this one. I've lived in and loved Oregon for most of my life as an ER doctor in rural Douglas County, as a legislator, and as a governor. I spent most of my life in Oregon, working with Oregonians, and standing up for Oregon values, standing up for middle class families, protecting our environment, defending a woman's right to choice. I'm running because those values are worth fighting for. And that's one of the differences in this race. But there are some others. We need jobs in Oregon. And I've actually helped create some, over 100,000, in fact. More importantly, I have a plan to create thousands of new jobs now when Oregonians need them the most. By contrast, my opponent has proposed an $800 million set of tax breaks that will benefit primarily upper-income Oregonians, but won't create a single job for the 200,000 people who are out of work today. And how are we going to pay for that? by taking money out of education, out of prevention, out of investments in children and families, the very things we need to be doing to move our state forward, the very services that struggling families need in the midst of a recession. In fact, over half of Mr. Dudley's proposals increase spending without providing a way to pay for them. This is no time to raise taxes, but it's also no time to spend money that we don't have. This is a great state, you know that, and we have the promise of a very, very bright future. But it's going to take a governor who can go to work on day one, creating jobs and work skills for the unemployed, protecting important social services, and defending our schools. Those are the things I've stood up for all my life. Those are the values that I believe in and that I will continue to fight for every single day. You can count on that. And here's something else you can count on. Oregon's best days really do lie ahead. My name is John Kitzhaber. I'm asking for your vote on November 2nd. Thank you very much. Before I thank the rest of our folks who helped uh, today, I wanted to say that Dr. Kitzhaber is going to stick around and answer questions. If folks in the room have any they'd like to direct to him, they can come up here and find him. And uh, I wanted to thank our Truth Squad members, Elizabeth Friedenwald, Jean Hart, and Kate Marks. Thank you also to our timekeeper, Elaine McCall, and a special thank you to our moderator, Russ Lewis. And again, a big thank you to our guest today, John Kitzhaber. Please join us again next week for a debate between two candidates for Oregon 5th Congressional District, Scott Brun and Kurt Schrader. We are adjourned.